everyone. I'm very excited to be here today with my friend Nick Vinaglu. Uh, he is an incredible guitarist, one of the best guitarists I've ever heard, um, and, and a wonderful teacher as well. So I'm super happy to have him here. Uh, and today he's going to talk with us about how to break down seventh chords into triads and how we can use that for our soloing and comping as well. So the main thing I wanted to talk about today was how to utilize seventh chords and arpeggios adding tensions to seventh chords to make more interesting sounding arpeggios and really just the relationship between harmony and melody and more when i say melody i'm thinking of soloing so the great thing that i kind of learned about harmony is that to me harmony and melody are pretty much the same exact thing so the way i approach soloing is through kind of deconstructing what is happening in the harmony maybe decorating the harmony a little bit more, making it sound more exciting by adding tensions, and then using arpeggios to really outline the sound of the chords, right? So specifically on guitar, it seems as though it's really hard for guitar players to like play the changes. I don't know if you've encountered that with your students before or anything. You know, the term playing the changes is something that I started encountering when I was learning jazz. Um, but it really applies to any style of music. Like you could be playing pop or funk or blues and all playing the changes means is when the chords change and you hear the soloist like outline every single chord individually, that's really what playing the changes is. It's like, you know, if you've ever been at a show and someone's just like nailing the solo and every time there's like a really big tense chord or something, they outline the changes there and it sounds like they're nailing every single change that comes their way. It's like, I always think of it like if you're driving on the highway and it's a sunny day, you're cruising, and then the rain comes on, boom, you put your windshield wipers on. And then rain turns off, turn your windshield wipers on. It's just like adapting to each moment um, to really fit like the scenario that you're in. Got it, so you're talking about while uh, soloing. Yeah, absolutely, so you're talking about following the changes while soloing, got it. So, you know, the first kind of example that I always like to go over is I just take something super, super simple, like a major seven chord, right? So if I took like C major seven. Now, when I think of what's going on inside of that C major seven, we just have root, third, fifth, seventh, or C, E, G, B, right? That's right. And the first thing I want to do with this structure is break out into what's inside of it, right? So when I have the notes C, E, G, B, right? I'll just take it here, C, Oh, I, e, I wrote it on the G. whiteboard already. I'm a step ahead oh, of you. Oh, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. I don't even have to worry about that. So we have, yeah. yeah, C, E, G, B. Now, what I can do is the structure has four notes in it, right? So I could hypothetically break it into two groups of three notes. So I could have C, E, G, which mm -hmm. is just our C major triad, easy. Yes. And then if I, you know, pretend the C wasn't there, I also have E, G, B, mm. which is an E minor triad. And when I first discovered this like it's it sounds crazy it's like there's a minor triad in a major seven chord like what the heck is that doing there right yeah and that got me really curious i'm like okay interesting so every seventh chord doesn't matter if it's major seven dominant seven minor seven minor seven, seven you could do this with I, I could break any four note structure into two groups of three so every seventh chord has two triads in it right yeah and that was always like a really fascinating thing because i was like wow, this whole time I've been thinking of a major seven chord, I think of this happy major sound because major chords should sound like major chords, right? And that mm -hmm. major third makes us feel happy and that joyful sound. And I'm like, how am I using a minor chord, which I've always associated with this dark, sad sound over a happy sound, like minor, right? Yeah. Or like major rather. So it's crazy that, you know, I could now, you know, say we're jamming over C major seven, right? And instead of soloing with like the C major scale or the major pentatonic or something, right? I might just stick to an E minor triad arpeggio, right? Which sounds mm -hmm. kind of elementary saying that out loud, like, oh, I'm just gonna play those three notes. But when you play it over a C chord. It sounds interesting. It sounds really interesting. And what you're really doing as a soloist playing that E minor triad is you're outlining like the juicy notes in that C chord, right? Yeah. I always say like the root is kind of like the bread of the sandwich, right? Yeah. And then 
the the upper tones like the third fifth seventh ninth etc are like the aioli yeah if you have to really drop yummy. if you have to drop one note out like the root would be a good one to drop out because it's kind of redundant and not as exciting as the other as the other notes exactly um and i also kind of feel like that about the fifth sometimes yeah, i don't know in the fifth. Feel oh for sure especially because with ukulele yeah. since they're only four strings i'm i constantly am having to drop out notes and chords and like pick my four favorite notes for any oh chord. right so I, you have to think, uh, with ukulele specifically, you have to think a lot about what are the most important notes or what are the most fun notes in a chord. And yeah, the root and the fifth are usually like the first to go, so. Goodness gracious. Throw them out. I didn't even think of that on the uke. That's great. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's that's kind of like a, a, a little basic way to break down any normal seventh chord, right? And yeah. you might say, okay, cool, that's cool. I'm still just playing a C major seven. That's not very exciting, right? Say the first you know, eight bars of the song is just stagnant on C major seven. I'm really still just playing the chord tones, right? It's cool that we can think of it as a major triad and a minor triad, but like what else? I wanna put some like salt and pepper and some spicy habanero pepper on the sandwich, right? Like how do we start spicing it up? Mm -hmm. So to me, like the main spice is just adding tensions, right? And the way I think of tensions are just like varying degrees of spice, you know, you have you're your nine, sharp 11, you're 11, you're 13, you're flat nine, you're sharp nine, you're sharp five, whatever, like all these different tensions available to us. And it's really just like how spicy you want your food, right? And I look at certain intervals as being more safe than others. Like for example, I don't wanna overgeneralize, but generally I will put a nine kind of wherever I want or a sixth and it will sound like fine. You know what I mean? If you're I'm like safe. in a pinch and I don't have time to like yeah, they're like the more safe options, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason being is because they're closer to our original structure, right? Mm -hmm. So when I first start seeing what I can do to branch out of wherever I'm at, right? So we look at our C major seven again, we just have C, E, G, B, right? Mm -hmm. And we know diatonic harmony is always built in thirds. So if I just keep counting up in thirds, I'm gonna generate my tensions, right? So C, E, G, B, the next third up would be D, which is my ninth. Yeah. Right. Now, something cool happens here because now we have a whole entire extra note, which means I could have an extra structure of three notes or I have another triad to access. Right. We have Ooh. two we had before C, E, G, C triad, E, G, B, E minor. And now we also have G, B, D, which is a G triad. And kind of sounds crazy, right? Because when we think, okay, if we're in the key of C major, right? Mm -hmm. We know G is like our five chord and that's like our dominant sound that makes us want to go back to our one chord C. So it's crazy that again, in a C major nine chord, right? This is all about context, of course. You know, we have, first of all, our root major triad. We have a minor triad and then we have another major triad that happens to be a G triad, which sounds kind of risky, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, and you might say like, how is this useful? Like, how am I going to use this in music, right? So again, if we're just playing jamming, the whole band's playing C major seven for the first, you know, eight, 16, 24 bars of the song, mm -hmm. I'm no longer limited to just, you know, my basic C major seven chord grips or same thing on ukulele, like whatever your go-to voicings are right mm -hmm. now i can make like really fun interesting rhythm parts i could go from you know a c triad to an e minor triad or to a g triad mm. and just going between those like i can it's already you know, a lot of imagine options a lot of options right and if you imagine like you know there's some bass player playing some bass line right mm -hmm. you can get really funky with it like instead of just having to sit there playing your go-to <laughs> C major seven, maybe I hit. Right, that's just G, C, G, E minor, right? And we have all these new sounds and I can access different parts of the fretboard, right? I'm not just locked into like my two normal go-to grips. Yeah. Um, does that does that make sense? For sure. And I'll just say really quickly, like when he's saying it moves up in thirds, just to explain it, just in case anyone got confused by that. Like if we're imagining like the whole C major scale, we have C, then D, then E, then F, right? G, A, B, C, D, right? This is, it's, it's, it's zigzag, but that's the whole C major scale, right? C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And when we, and we're moving up in thirds, we're just counting like the three notes, one, two, three. 
We moved up a third. One, two, three. We moved up another third. One, two, three. We moved up another third. One, two, three. We moved up another third. So that's all he's doing there is just moving up in, in thirds, up, up the scale, really, up the C major scale. So very cool. So, yeah, we have, right. we have three different triad options, which is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool to think how basically all chords can be broken down into triads. It just, it's... Every, everything can be boiled yeah. into triads in a way, which is pretty cool. Exactly. And that's that's always a point I try to run home because people, especially for me being a guitar player, whenever I'm teaching a guitar student, they're like, oh, well, I just want to learn the really big, crazy sounding voicings. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, I don't understand what's going on inside of there. I'm like, oh, it's just these two triads happening. And they're like, oh, but I don't know my triads. And I'm like, this is why triads are yeah. so important. You got to know your um, triads first. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then the the other side to this right is now we have this big like five note structure c e g b d our c major nine mm -hmm. and we've been going cool well, we can break this into groups of three notes which are our triads right mm -hmm. but now that we have five notes to work with i could actually break those into two groups of four now right so oh, wow. if i cover up the d right we just have our original c major seven mm -hmm. that's what we started with that's that's cool so what happens if I, you know, pretend the C is gone? The bass player is playing a C. I don't need to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Now I just have E, G, B, D. And that spells an E minor 7 chord. So this is where it starts getting really sick because, you know, and for guitar players who know, like, their, their basic shapes here, right? E minor 7, if I play a C in the bass, I now literally just have our C major 9 sound. But here's where it comes into handy for translating this to like a soloing option, right? Because we've up until now really focused on coming up with different course. rhythm parts. Yeah, what's going on inside of each chord, right? But check us out. Now, cool, we're playing again. Same, same thing. We're playing over, you know, C major 7. And in my head, I could go, okay, well, sure, you know, maybe I use C major 7 arpeggio. What happens if I now go, well... Okay, the band's playing C major 7. I'm going to go ahead, add a little spice to the top, play that C major 9, and I'm just going to think of it as an E minor 7 arpeggio so that it sounds a little more juicy, right? So mm. now when I'm soloing over C major 7, I can obviously access my C major 7, but I can also hit my E minor 7 arpeggio, which is going to make that C major 7 sound yeah. So this is just like a little shortcut to accessing those other sounds because a lot of the times I'll have guitar players go, well, oh, you know, I just want to outline the ninth. I'll just emphasize the D and I'll play the major scale. I'll emphasize the one note. Mm -hmm. But then it always ends up sounding kind of really obvious. You'll hear someone go. Yeah. And it's like it doesn't it doesn't sound as musical right mm -hmm. so if i want to yeah. outline the ninth of c major seven i just think e minor seven arpeggio it just sounds a lot more direct into that sound right yeah yeah um, that's awesome does that make sense absolutely and then you know the last kind of step that i take into doing this um you know you could continue going up in thirds right to get your 11th your 13th etc um what I like to do, again, to keep it more in the safe zone, because this just makes this whole idea a little more applicable like across the board, mm -hmm. is you know, I look at my original structure of C major 7, C, E, G, B, yeah. and I say, okay, we added one tension on the top, right? We went up three notes, we went up a third, and we found D, our ninth, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I could also say, instead of stacking and stacking on top, what if I went behind the structure, if I went below the root, down a third right mm. and if i went below a third from c i get the note a right right and a lot of you might think oh this is like is that the relative minor c comparison and yes you know if you're in the key of c you play a c chord and you go down a third to a minor that is technically your six chord you're going to your relative minor but we're not thinking outside of our c major seven structure right now so this is where i want you to really just be like okay we're we're just worried about the chord of the moment here c major right. seven so going down a third, right, will give me the note A. And if you think kind of, you almost have to think backwards now because you're like, wait, now we're talking below the root, which means is this a whole new chord now? Does this make this an A minor chord? Mm -hmm. No, I still want you to think of it as C, right? So all you have to do is say, okay, what is A in relationship to C? If I count up from the root C, D, E, F, G, A, oh, it's just my sixth. 
Mm -hmm. Sweet. And we know six is always kind of a safe option along with ninth. So yes. again, introducing that A gives us an entirely new triad, right? We have A, C, E. We have an A minor triad. So we now have, you know, a C triad, E minor triad, G triad, and A minor triad to work with. Adding in that extra note also gives us an extra seventh chord, A minor seven. Right. Holy crap. So now we have A, C, E, G, A minor 7, C, E, G, B, our original C major 7, and E, G, B, D, E minor 7. And we can do the same thing that I just showed you with the A minor 7 as that we did with the E minor 7. So again, I'm soloing over C major 7, right? And now I can think, okay, any A minor 7 arpeggio that I know is, is totally fair game. So Here's where it becomes like a soloing explosion, <laughs> for lack of a better word, right? Uh -uh. I'm soloing over C major seven, and I'm gonna think, okay, I'm gonna use my A minor seven arpeggio, I'm gonna use my E minor seven arpeggio, and I'm gonna use my C major seven arpeggio. So I have these three arpeggios. Mm -hmm. Now, even if you just know your basic arpeggios off the low E string and the A string root, you can get away with so much more real estate on the neck. You know, for example, I could say, okay, for options, I have E minor, starting all the way down here. I have A minor, I have C, and we start repeating A minor, E minor, C, right? E minor, A minor, C major seven, right? A minor, C, and then E minor. So it's like, <laughs> we literally have covered, you know, the lowest, to the highest note we can reach. I only have 22 frets. If you have 24 frets, that'll probably be easier. Um, and what this does is it now gives us so much more creative freedom on the neck, right? Mm -hmm. And again, this is just over one chord we're working with. And to kind of bridge that gap between harmony and melody, again, what which what I was saying in the beginning, it's like, I used to always think like, okay, when I'm playing rhythm guitar, that's this lane, I gotta stay here. And when I'm soloing, I just gotta think like shredding licks and pentatonics and going crazy, right? Right. And when I realized like, oh, I could have my harmony, my rhythm playing completely inform my soloing, right? Mm, and it yeah. just makes it sound so much more intentional. Like, you know, you listen to a guitar solo that's only a couple notes and they bend up to this one note and everyone in the crowd is like, oh, wow. <laughs> What was that? Oh, he's bending up to the third of that chord and he's going back down to the root of this chord, right? It's it's always something very simple. And that's, again, same example as like playing the changes. Mm -hmm. um, does, that all, does that all make sense? Is that adding up? Absolutely, yeah. I think it would be cool to maybe uh, show like, if so if people wanted to start practicing arpeggios, do you have, well, first off, do you have arpeggios on your website for people? Like if they, on the Donut Doctor and stuff? Yeah, a hundred percent. There's a whole, I mean, there's a whole masterclass on like all of these things. There's a whole like Rehar masterclass. There's a whole, cool. uh, yeah, playing so if, the changes masterclass, like yeah, chord tone soloing. Yeah. So if you're a guitar player and you really want to like dive deep into these arpeggios and stuff, uh, definitely go check out uh, Nick's website, um, and I'll obviously put a link to it to get a lot of those arpeggios and, and be able to practice them. But could you show us maybe like um, like one simple arpeggio to sort of practice, like uh, right now, just like a, a, if you were to like sort of briefly approach a basic arpeggio, how to pra begin practicing it? Yeah, a hundred percent. So obviously, this whole idea and the, all these concepts only work if you have all of your triads like on lockdown, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that I try to encourage my students to learn these, um, to start, always have two go-to kind of grips, right? So you want one on the low E string and you want one on the A string. Mm. Um, and that will cover you for most uh, circumstances that you're in, right? So for example, the low E string, I might play C major seven. <laughs> On the A string, they're gonna sound identical, but be different fingerings, right? The A string root. Now, as an exercise, and this is super important to make it more fluid, what I want you to do is work on connecting those two together. So for example, I might ascend my A string root arpeggio and then descend my low E string arpeggio. So here's A string ascending. And now I'm gonna, descend my 
low E string. And I could do that in reverse as well. And another really important thing with practicing arpeggios, and this applies really to, to every instrument, to uh, especially stringed instruments, um, and it doesn't have to just be arpeggios. You can use this with your scales, with really anything, is what I do when I'm practicing every other day, I practice everything descending. Mm. And it might sound really easy, but go yeah. try it right now. And it's going to be crazy how difficult it is, yeah, right? Even if it's just starting, starting all your major scales, you know, from the top. Something as simple as that, as, you know, musicians and especially stringed players, we always have to start like... Everyone's always so used to starting from the bottom yeah, and working yeah. their way up. And that's totally fine. But then when you go to solo, I find a lot of people sounding kind of like this. Like, okay, I'm going from, you know, say we're going from C major 7 to G major 7. Instead of being able to just kind of jump between one or two, you always hear this. You hear... It's like, okay, I gotta start on the root, find my way up, and then I'm in my zone, I can start soloing. But right, right. that's where it becomes less melodic and more like, mm -hmm. you know. You're going through the motions. In my, in my experience, yeah, I've just found people get really discouraged by arpeggios because of that. Because they're yeah. like, well, every time I'm flowing, and then the chords change, gotta move down gotta to the root go here, back gotta down move again. up to the root. Mm. So, you know, practicing everything from the top. First of all, even if you do have to start on the root every time on the top, it just sounds way less obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so much weight in like starting on the lowest note and then working your way back up, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's. I think it's just like built into nature that it's harder to descend things. Like I always, I always think about this. I'm like, you know, I can like run up a ladder. That's totally fine. Getting down a ladder is impossible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. That's or like, funny. I'm sure like taking off an airplane it's not it's not that hard you know what i mean you, anyway you just floor it and then lift up you're in the air right. and then landing a plane yeah what you know what i mean yeah cats run up trees they can't get back to it's like right right it's just built into nature so uh i always you know i always alternate my practice days everything descending you know monday wednesday friday yeah because all the other like, days i'm ascending but it's like controlled falling is descending so it's like scary yeah it's more dangerous 100 <laughs> percent. yeah um and so when you're playing those arpeggios so yeah, you're just playing the notes in the chord right that's all you're doing yeah that's that's the beauty of it yeah you could know, you even like say simple. the it's... names of the notes that you're playing in the, the arpeggio you just did and stuff just for just to make it really yeah simple? yeah so for example right c major seven um arpeggio and one more thing to, especially for guitar players when you play your arpeggios i always encourage you to play the full chord first so i'm gonna say okay i'm gonna play c major seven arpeggio i'm gonna kind of get my ears ready to play the chord because again all an arpeggio is is the notes of the chord played in succession right so i'm gonna play my chord get my ears ready this is the sound i'm working with and then i'm just gonna play those four notes over and over and over right. i have my root third fifth seventh repeats root third fifth seventh root or just c e g b c e g b c e See, you know, it's on yeah. and on forever. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's very. And helpful. that's yeah, that's that's kind of how I would say to to start it. Awesome. Well, this has been so great, Nick. Um, I think uh, this is uh, very helpful for people. And um, as I said, if you want to learn more about these arpeggios, all these voices, Nick has a fantastic website. Um, can you tell me the name of the website again? It's donut. yeah, it's um, the donut doctor music dot com. The donut doctor music dot com. <laughs> Yeah, and he has yeah. he has so much material there. I mean, he has tons and tons of video lessons, uh, printable PDFs of charts of things written out for you. Of just there's a ton of material All there. All the goodies. Yeah. So um, if you're a guitarist, I, I really, I mean, I've checked out a bunch of guitar teaching websites, and I think his is uh, one of the best ones I've ever seen. So it really has a lot of oh, uh, nice. good stuff in it. So. Um, and Nick just has a really great way of teaching that I think is very approachable. And uh, yeah, you're able to break things down in a way that really makes sense, which is really, um, which is uh, special. So, so definitely go check that out that if you want to learn more. From you. I feel like you're the most like eloquent, clear, oh, God, make no. really hard things definitely sound not, super but, easy. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you again so much for joining Nick. And um, yeah, yeah, be sure to check out his YouTube channel as well. He's got a growing YouTube channel here.
Thank you again for joining. All right. Thanks, Nick. Have a good one. Thank you.